Yes, let it ring you out. Uh, I want to start off, keep it going, I want to start off the new year with greetings, salutations, not only to you here, uh, to the families that are joining us. Uh, we improved our system this year, so those of you watching at home, I can see you now. I can see you, and don't worry, you're not the only one in your PJs, it's okay. So, uh, but we're happy to have you here this morning, for those joining us online, for those either in your cars, throughout the building, happy new year. Look at that, you guys responded. And now the rest of the sermon, when I ask questions, you'll be like, huh, what? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm excited today because uh, we're, we're studying for the next 22 weeks, 22 gifts God has for you. For those of us that, that have come and, and, and live in a life in Christ, that there are specific gifts. Sometimes we think it's, it's we get Jesus and then just twiddle your thumbs until kingdom comes. That's not what it is. There's so much more to it. And so each week we're going to be talking about a gift. And, and when the time for you is appropriate, we, we want to get people in small groups and life groups sharing the gift of fellowship together. And so whether it's right now or whether it's in the next few weeks, uh, when the time's appropriate, we want to get those things going. Our first one, if you're up for it, uh, we're going to have a group meeting here tonight at 5. By the way, Jen, we're going to be here tonight at 5. Um, that's how we communicate in our family. If I say it from the pulpit, it goes. Okay. So uh, uh, we'd love to get you guys in groups. Now that I've said my glad tidings, let's go with gripes. Are you guys ready? Let's start off 22 with some gripes. Here's my gripe. We've got some beautiful kids in-house tonight. That's not the gripe. The gripe is, see, when I was growing up, it was a, like, one-shot-and-you-were-done photo. Like, you didn't know what you got, okay? And so you would take the photo and then you would print it out and and for some reason as a child I don't know one of my eyes was like I'll be the lazy one this one and so one of them would be like half closed and then I knew how to smile except when my picture was being taken because then I decided either to show all my teeth like I was trying to eat something or hold my breath and you know puff up my cheeks here's the thing beautiful kids and when you get the Christmas cards you're like oh wow they look so beautiful because that was like the 48th shot, you know? Okay, so, so those of you my age or older, you know what the red-eyed demon look was that, that you got from Kodak, okay? You'd be like, oh, the family looks great, except for the possessed one over there in the corner, you know? Like, that doesn't happen anymore. Like, you guys, your kids are adorable. And I know, because I have some. Some of you are like, hey, your Christmas card photo looked really great. I was like, you should have seen the other 60, okay? We lost a child midway. We don't know what happened. We had four, actually. We don't, know where, we don't know where that child went. But here's the thing. So here's the gripe. Is that in reality, things aren't always as great as they look. You know, like, we, not a single one of you for your Christmas card, like, let's, what, what's the worst photo? Let's, let's use that one. You go with the best, because that's what we desire. We desire when things look right. And you know when you have two that are really close to being there, and you're like, all right, which one are we sacrificing? Which one are we going to allow to be the one that looks the worst? It's always me. It's me. Um, but, but this is the gripe I have, okay? Uh, the uh, mid-2000s, uh, we went digital, which means, that means we didn't print photos up anymore. Just like, hey, can I see your photos? Yeah, they're on my camera, they're on my phone. I don't know why, but uh, that's kind of how things went. So that's my, that's my first gripe. Second gripe, and maybe you guys are with me on this one. When was the last time you washed a window? Some of you, that's the gripe. I wish they would wash the windows. How many of you have washed a window and realize for the rest of the day you were irritated because you could not get that window the way you wanted it to look. And so when you're like, you're a foot from it, you're like, oh, that's good. And then you would sit down, you're like, that is terrible. That is worse than when I started. Are you, are you guys feeling me? Some of you are like, no, because you never wash windows. Go wash a window. Trust me, it's great. And, and here's another thing. There was a Honduran restaurant down in Tennessee. Loved it. Went once, never going to go again. Here's why. On the wall, they had a big geometric tile display and one tile was turned the wrong way you guys know what I'm saying you would you would never eat there again you would never eat there again how many of you have been driving and you see the manhole cover with the white line on it not connected to the original white line how many of you want to stop your car and fix that you, you see what I'm saying we want things to be correct how many of you are the one that you look at a stranger and you're like, I really just want to wipe their shoulder. I really just, I want to dust their shoulder. There's, there's fuzz on their shoulder. How many, of you, how many of you pick fuzz off of strangers? Admit it. We got some here, okay? We got some. Okay, okay. How many of you are the stranger that doesn't mind the fuzz getting picked off? 
both of these groups are, are odd, okay? Both of these groups are odd. Some of you are like, please pick fuzz off of me. You're throwing fuzz all over you. You, just, you need a hug. Come see me. I'll give you a hug, okay? Here's, here's my gripes, is that we, we really desire things to look right, but too often they don't. Too often things are a little bit off. The first gift for you guys, as we study, the first gift for you, it, it's threefold. And what I mean to that, to get to the gift, you kind of you kind of got to walk through a couple of gifts. How many of you opened a present and it was the box inside the box that was inside the box? Okay, because you have children and they... Well, I didn't have kids. Edie Bates. <laughs> Edie Bates is a box inside a box inside a box wrapper. And, and sadly, it's in the middle. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But you guys see what I'm saying, that, that you got to keep digging. Well, well what we got to do is we got to go three layers deep to get to this gift. And what I want to talk about, I want to talk about the three trees... Uh, that we see in the garden, and, and some of you are like, which three are they? We'll get to it. The three trees that we see in the garden, and I want us to see that the gift of the third one is something so beautiful, something that God has in store for us. At some point, I'm going to get back to my notes, but now's not the time, okay? I, uh, I was talking with one of you folks, one of, one of the members of this mighty congregation, and uh, the, the phrase started, you know, when you're preaching, I have a problem with, and I was, they're big, I was all ears. What's the problem? I was thinking, did, was I theologically off? Did you not like the translation of the Bible I was using? Did, did I hammer something too, home, uh, too hard or too soft? And, and what I got was, the, the thing I, I struggle with, the thing I don't like is that, pause for dramatic effect, sometimes your pants need ironed. Okay, all right. Like there, there is certain things that drive some of us a little batty. Or there are certain things that some of us will pick up on, and it's just not right, and we want to fix it. And so what I want us to understand, that God loves us to the point that he wants it to be all right. Okay? He wants it to be all right. As we look at these gifts, each gift is going to come from one chapter of the Bible. We're going to go cover to cover, so that means we'll go uh, in ascending order. So we're starting in Genesis chapter 3 is where we're going to find our first gift. If you turn to Genesis chapter 3, there will only be about one or two other places you can either throw a thumb or just write down for later. But Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see the first gift, which is the tree of life, but I want to give you some anticipation as we work to get there because that's the third layer of the box that Edie has wrapped for us. <laughs> Mom made fun of my pants. It's my own mother. She's watching from home. I can see her. Your pants aren't so nice, Mom. She's not wearing any. All right. Before we... Some of you are like, I, I've never heard this guy preach before. Is this normal? Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. There's, there's a preaching voice, and then there's the voice inside my head that gets out. Everyone forgives me, I hope. All right, Genesis chapter 3. We've got a dialogue going on in Genesis chapter 3, okay? We've got Adam and Eve. We have them in the garden, and we get that connotation, but someone shows up at the beginning of chapter 3. And that someone is a serpent, and that someone is shrewd. That someone is pointing in the direction that God said no. And that someone is, is evil personified as the devil, as, as Satan, trying to pull away, trying to detract, trying to mess up the photo of what God has prepared. Trying to put the little red eyes, not only in his eyes, but in everyone else's, and mess up the photo. And so he says, does God really say you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Our first tree, our first tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want to say something here. Generally, in the context of this tree, okay, the name is what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which one do we generally think of, of those two words, good and evil? Evil. I want to back up. The word good's there. Have you guys caught that? It's been there the whole time. There's something good about this tree, and I think we miss it. Too often we say, well, they ate from this tree. That was evil. Now they're out of there. 
And that's not fair. Or is it? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here's the thing. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil allows Adam and Eve to see all. Okay? Let me, let me put this in context. If a man were to look into the eyes of the woman he desires, and he was to say something sweet like, baby, you're the one I want. That's about as sweet as it gets for me. Baby, you're the one I want. That woman could be really excited, or it could really mean nothing. Here's what I mean. If these two people are the only inhabitants, inhabitants, it's a new year and I'm still mispronouncing words, inhabitants, okay, if these two are the only inhabitants of a deserted island, and this man looks into the only other occupant of said island's eyes and says, woman, baby, you're the one I want. Does that really hold much weight? I mean, mind you, she beat out the palm trees. Hooray. But if this same guy could travel the world, if this same guy could get on a boat, could get on a plane, could get on whatever fancy form of transportation he want, and he could look eye to eye to every woman on the face of the earth, and then come back to that island and to say, baby, you're the one I want. Does that hold a little bit more weight? Does that hold a little bit more weight? Okay. What I want us to see, and the tree of, the no of knowledge of good and evil, when Adam and Eve take of it, all of a sudden, they go from being just the inhabitants of an island with God to all of a sudden they get to see it all. They get to view it all. And I'll tell you this. There is good and there is evil. And they see it all. The, the Amish have something called rumspringa. Rumspringa. It sounds as cool as it is, okay? Now, rumspringa happens somewhere between age 14 and 17, and that's when they say to the young child, hey, you, rumspringa. I don't know if that's what they do, but I'm assuming because it sounds so much cooler. And that is where the child is told to kind of go and see step outside of the island of the Amish community and see what the world has to offer. And then they've got to make a choice. Do they stay with what the world offers or do they come home? See, no, none of them are forced. Well, that we know of. They're rumspringed. Okay, but they have the option to see and then make their choice. Do I want to be a part of this community or I don't, do I want to see and, and, and indulge in what the world has to offer? And a lot of them, what they do, they indulge, and then they're inclined to go home. And some of them indulge, and they say, I'm not going home. And that's, that's this process that we see happening in the garden, that all of a sudden, our rum springa is when our eyes open to the knowledge of the good and evil, and all of a sudden, we step off of that island, as Adam and Eve step off of that island, and see all. Some of you are like, wait a second, I thought the door was closed. I thought they didn't really get to come home. We're going to get to that tree. All of a sudden, there is an alternative. All of a sudden, we have the choice to love God appropriately rather than God just being the only one on that island that we've ever seen and that we've ever known. Why give, why does God place the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If God knew they would eat of it, if God knew they would partake of it, if God knew he would have to banish them, why even put the tree there why not just you know make it just the tree of life and we're all happy and we're all good and, and it's just God and us and humanity and, and nothing outside of that it's because the tree of the knowledge of good good and evil upon seeing all we get to decide what is truly good is it the creator or is there all the created? When we eat, and, and mind you, we are born into that knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've got a conscious choice to make. Do we return to what is good? Do we seek the love of God? Or do we just spurn it? Do we just leave it? Do we just take what the world has to offer? Let's look at this way. From chapter 3, I'm going to the tail end of chapter 3. 
you've got the dialogue between God and man. But after, afterwards, the fall, this is said, the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, the triune nature of God right there, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Okay, there's our third tree. The second tree I haven't said yet. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. If they reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it, they will live forever. I'm going to take a big concept here and try to narrow it down. I don't know if God is referring explicitly to an actual tree from which you eat, you live eternally, or if this is symbolism, and it doesn't matter. But what I do know, the tree of life, its purpose is that when we are in its presence, when we are feeding off of it, we live eternally. So you can look right here at what's happening in a harsh light or in a loving light. I want to go on, verse 23. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> Garden of Eden. He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And that sounds awesome. For those of you that are sword lovers, do you have a, do you have a flaming sword? Because God does. Okay. Now, this, this sounds harsh. He banished them. He kicked them off the island. He did because they were no longer good. He did because a choice had been made and they were currently imperfect. They were broken. They were the tile that was out of place. They were the manhole cover shifted to the side. They were the photograph with the eye half closed, the other eye red, and the smile crooked. He banished them because they were not in the place to where God would want them to be internally that way. Is that making sense? What God is doing is in his perfection, he wants those with him perfected. This is where we get to the second tree. The second tree is alluded to in Isaiah 11 and in John 15. I'm going to read briefly out of both. See, the second tree starts as a shoot, or starts as a twig, starts as a small growth out of the stump of David's family, King David, from Jesse, from the family of Jesse, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on that root. The Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge the fear of the Lord, and that root, that sprout from the line of Jesse, it'll delight in obeying the Lord. It'll give justice, it'll make fair decisions, and not only that, the earth is going to shake at its word. The second tree, if we're not grasping what it is out of Isaiah, what's being pointed to, turn to John 15. Because Jesus speaks these words in John 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Jesus goes on to say, I am that second tree. I am that vine. And in me, you get to be the branches. Those who remain in me, those that I am in them, will produce much fruit. But yet apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. 
Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want. It will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. As parents, we have the simplicity of mind to know the photos we keep are the ones that look the most perfect. The photos we display are the ones that look the best. And frankly, even though it can hurt a a family's heart, we will delete the photos that are blurry. We will delete the photos where the eyes are closed. We will delete the photos where that awkward smile or someone's looking to see what the dog is doing. We get rid of those ones. What am I trying to say? We have a good father who loves his children. And he has provided a branch. He has provided a vine for every single one of us to stand in perfection, to be placed just as his son on display in his heavenly kingdom. Do we gather that? God seeks perfection because God is perfect. God seeks holiness because God is holy. God seeks love because God is love. And I will say this in the most broken English I can. I ain't any of those things. Separate and apart from the vine that is Jesus Christ. And so going with the metaphor here, my life in Christ, the red eye gets removed. And my life in Christ, the crooked smile in the photo gets made straight. And my life in Christ, that, that, that awkward face where it's like, I don't think he cares to be here, gets turned to a place of joy because of my life in Christ. It is in Christ we are made perfect. It is in Christ we are made respectable. It is in Christ we are made to be placed on display. We have to understand all of us are that messed up photo. And all of us, through Jesus Christ, can be perfected and be put on display in God's kingdom. I don't care how ugly you look in the photo. Let's be honest. There are photos you don't show anyone. You've taken that selfie and you go, oh my goodness. God knows. And some of you, your lives, you have seen stuff that you do not let anyone else know. You keep it to yourself. God knows. And when we say all have sinned, that doesn't mean everyone across the board kind of made a white lie from time to time. No, no, no. The label of sin includes all, no matter how bad, no matter how awful. Even if you are mid-sneeze in your photo or you just have the crooked smile, it doesn't matter. All are there and all have the ability to be perfected through the love that is the vine, that is the lifeblood of Jesus Christ. Christ. Listen, for the one that lived is the one who died. Where did he die? He hung hung upon a tree. They hung him upon a tree for life for you and me. Do we get that? So in this first tree of good and evil, we have decisions to make. We have decisions to make that we can choose good, and that is God. Or we can choose evil, and that is everything else separate from God. And here's the thing. When you choose God, all of a sudden, everything becomes good. I'm just, choose God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we get to make a conscious decision to look at the world or look at the creator and choose which one we want. And then all of a sudden we realize, but I'm not. And he says, but I am through my son. This is where desire plays in. This is where we get to the gift. This is where we get to the third tree. Because the third tree is right here. The tree of life. It is a tree that sustains. It is the tree that I don't get it, but it goes on forever. 
And my concept of forever goes back to the movie Sandlot when I hear a little boy go, forever. And which some way helps me comprehend the word forever. I don't know why, but it does. Some of you are like, Rob, we comprehend things when you speak slowly too. You're welcome. Forever. I'll tell you this. I don't forever want to be the discarded, messy, broken photo. I want to be with God. And I want to be with God forever. And the crazy thing about our Father is I know what my hands have done. I know what they've done. And every time I hold them up, he sees the perfected hands of Jesus Christ. And I know myself, because I look in the mirror, and I see myself as a a withered, stupid dude that's made plenty of mistakes. And yet he looks back and he sees his own beautiful, perfect son. They say sometimes there's a face only a mother or only a father can love. That's our faces, guys. You guys got them. I can see half of them on some of you. We have a father that loves us because of what Christ has done for us. This is where desire plays in, is our desire at the tree of life, is our desire in the forever, is our desire there. And this is the gift, it's anticipation. Because right now, I understand there is brokenness. Right now, I understand some of you are like, it's a new year, but it doesn't feel like it still stinks. Smells a lot like 2020, and that was an entire year ago. It's like two years ago. That's, what is going on? And in all of this, brokenness and disjointedness and things not seem right, we can, here's the gift, anticipate the forever, and in the forever, know that we will be made completely whole. We will be made perfect, where there will be no crying, where there will be no pain. And as we said last week, we get God. Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. I have never worked in, what is the photo rooms called? The, the black room, the red room, what, what's that thing called? The, just, is it called a dark room? Is that it? What a lame name. We need to change that. Okay. I've never done anything photography wise other than smiled when someone took photos. But this is how our life works. We know the image. We know the image. And here's how the washing of the robe works. God takes that ugly image and he washes it in the blood of Jesus Christ. And out he pulls the beauty that is his own divine son. And that is you. And that is me. When we look at the first tree and we choose a good father rather than the absence of God, and that's the evil all around us. And when we make that choice, when that is our desire, we get the second tree. That is the life in the vine. And then we get to live in the gift, the gift that we are starting off this year, that we are starting off this study, the anticipation of a perfection that will last forever in light of in, in the presence of an almighty God. So right now in anticipation, you can look at the brokenness and say, he's still working on me. Right now you can look at the sin struggles and say, oh, there's coming a day. Temptation's going away. And you can look at all of these things, and that is the gift that God gives us, that the tree of life is there for our anticipation to know that all this mess is going away. All these struggles are going away. He has permanently set you free today so you can be permanently perfected with him for eternity. Permanently in his holy presence. And permanently he will see the holy presence of his child through the vine that is Jesus Christ. So today, your gift is the anticipation of the tree of life and being perfected in his glory.